Hello world, Greg Strike here, and welcome back to The Curious Place. I'm glad you're here. This video is part of a multi-part series where we are exploring some electronics basics by modifying a home-built 6502 computer. The modifications we're making, they're a little crazy, they're not very efficient, but they're a lot of fun. Stay tuned. Welcome back guys. In this video, we're gonna continue on our journey to give our home-built computer the ability to read data off a standard audio cassette, just like they would have in the late 1970s, utilizing something called the Kansas City Standard. If you haven't seen the previous video yet, you may wanna go check that out because we cover things like the history of the Kansas City Standard, the theory of how it works, as well as the first part of our build. When we're done here today, we will be able to see actual data coming from our audio cassette and we'll be ready for the next video where we present that to our 6502 computer. So before we get started, I wanted to provide a couple of resources for those of you that are building this circuit or a similar one. First, a tool that I've used extensively for this project is a script called PyKCS. PyKCS was written by a guy named David Beasley, who has a long standing history of contributing to the Python community. PyKCS in its original form would actually take a standard text file and encode that into a WAV file, including Kansas City standard audio. This is really useful for us because now we have predictable data that we can feed our circuit for troubleshooting. The problem that I ran into with it, however, was that it only worked with text files, and I needed to update that in order to work with binary files as well, otherwise we wouldn't be able to feed it a program. With David's permission, I've updated this script and I've published that on my GitHub, which you can find in the description below. Some of you have been looking for a higher resolution image of the circuit, so I've published one on my website, www.gregorystrike.com. Feel free to check that out if you'd like to see it in more detail. Let's get into it. Well, last we saw each other, we had created this beautifully shaped signal from our incoming Kansas City standard data. We did a good job, but now what do we do with it? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is this data is actually coming in serially as opposed to parallel. And all this means is that the data is coming in one bit at a time, as opposed to all the bits being transmitted at once. And somehow, we need to get this data over to the computer. So what we're going to do now is utilize a chip called the W65C22 Versatile Interface Adapter. And it's the one that's provided with Ben's 6502 kit, if you've built that. It's a pretty versatile chip. I mean, versatile is literally right there in the name, and it could greatly simplify our design by really limiting the amount of hardware that we need to build. But I don't want to go too far. One of the many things that it could do for us is actually handle the conversion of serial data into parallel for us. And we really could have used that functionality, but I liked the idea of learning how to do the conversion ourselves, and in doing so, it also has the added benefit of being able to light up some awesome LEDs and make this look a bit cooler. So I've decided we're going to handle the serial to parallel conversion ourselves and then provide parallel data to the computer. Using the information we learned in the last video, let's think through some of the things that we'll need to do in order to make this work. First, we're going to need some place to catch this data as it comes in serially from our last circuit so that we can do something with it later. In electronics, catching or storing data can also be referred to as latching. One of the most common methods of dealing with a situation like this is using something called a shift register, and specifically a serial in parallel out shift register. Shift registers are pretty cool. Let's cover some of the basics of shift registers, and specifically the features that we're going to be using in this project. Here, you see a pretty basic shift register. This shifty eyed fella, we're gonna call him shifty. He has eight bits of output, a serial pin, a clock pin, and a clear pin. The shift register's purpose is literally to shift data bits one way or the other. That's where it literally gets its name. In our case, we're only going to be shifting bits to the right, and this will actually happen anytime there's a clock pulse on the clock pin. Let me explain. Notice here that the serial pin is currently high and the outputs of the register are low. Whatever we see here on the outputs is what's currently stored within the shift register. If we send a high pulse to the clock pin, all the data on the shift register, which is currently all zeros, is shifted to the right and whatever's on the serial line is stored within the leftmost bit. This leaves us with the shift register output looking like this. Now let's put the serial pin low and send another clock pulse. 
We'll see again that all the data on the shift register is shifted to the right and the low from the serial line is put in the leftmost bit. So let's bring the serial line high again and send another clock pulse. Just like before, everything will shift to the right, but now the leftmost bit is high because the serial line was high when the clock pulse was triggered. If we bring the serial line low again and send yet another clock pulse, you'll see that the low will get added to the leftmost bit. When we do this over and over again, our data will eventually make it all the way over to the last bit in the shift register. It's safe there for now, however it's only safe until the next clock pulse comes. If we haven't done anything with it and the clock pulse comes, this data is lost forever. 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 Farewell data. So before we lose any data, all we need to do is have some circuitry connected to the outputs and we can read all the bits directly from the shift register. If you look here, you'll notice that we have shifted our trusty hexadecimal 55 onto the shift register and converted a serial signal into a parallel. The shift register also has a clear pin. Guess what it does? Yeah, anytime it receives a pulse, all the data on the shift register is cleared. Oops. There's one more cool thing that we can do with a shift register that I'd like to talk about. If we connect the last bit of the shift register to the serial line of another shift register, and we connect the clock pins together and the clear pins together, we've essentially just made a bigger shift register. Now, anytime a clock pulse appears on the shift register, it actually clocks both of them, and both shift registers do their shifty thing just like they normally would. Notice here that there's a high on the last bit of the first shift register and that we wired this to be presented on the serial line of the next shift register. When we send the clock pulse, it's brought over and shifted into the next shift register's leftmost bit just like before. And the same with the clear. If we now clear the shift register, both shift registers are cleared. So if we look at our circuit, you can see I've added two shifties here and tied them together as I just described. I've decided to use two shift registers here because of the optional parity bit we talked about in our first video. This may come in handy if we ever want to build in air detection. These shift registers are where we'll store our current byte as it comes in from the last video's demodulation circuit. These chips are 74 HC-595s and each can store 8 bits. To tie these together, the chips actually have a special pin to use called QH' prime, indicated with a backtick. It's pretty much the same thing as the last pin, but it works slightly differently to ensure it properly clocks in at the next shift register. The LEDs here are connected to the outputs of the shift registers and then are brought to ground using 560 ohm resistors. So these LEDs will now display whatever is stored on the shift registers. Sweet! So now we have a place to store our data. What else do we need? Well, as we learned, our shift registers need a clock signal of some kind in order to trigger when to latch data from the serial line. So somehow, we need to generate a clock signal that pulses every time there's a new bit ready from the demodulator for the shift register to read. From our last video, we learned that Kansas City Standard is 300 baud, which means that this clock signal should pulse 300 times a second. So let's talk about that. We're going to create this clock using the 555 timer. The 555 timer is a legend among legends, and it's a well-known chip and it has so many uses. We could do a whole video on the 555 itself, but we're just going to talk a little bit about the basics here. The 555 is pretty versatile and can be configured to operate in different modes. It has an A-stable mode, a bi-stable mode, and yes, even mono-stable mode. Ah, oh, you remember Mr. Mono-stable. Bi-stable mode means that it has two stable states. When we talk about stable states in a circuit, we're talking about a state like high and low that a circuit will stay in unless acted upon. And we're actually going to talk about bi-stable circuits a bit later in this video. So for now, just know that bi-stable means that it has two stable states. And we need a clock signal that constantly changes or pulses, so we're not going to be using bi-stable for our clock signal. Then there's mono-stable mode. You met Mr. Monostable in the last video. This refined gentleman has one stable state. He's stable unless triggered. Once triggered, he enters his unstable state and gradually will work his way to his stable state. But that's not what we need either. Again, we need a circuit that constantly changes. So, stay cool, Mr. Monostable. Then there's A-stable mode. Now this is what I'm talking about. 
In a stable mode, the 555 has no stable state, so it will continuously move between both states, high to low, then low to high, over and over and over again. This could also be called an oscillator. And these types of circuits will create a signal that looks like this. And we can control the speed and duration of the pulses using different resistors and capacitors with our 555. I've configured a 555 in a stable mode and placed it here. Here I'm using a one microfarad capacitor, a 10 nanofarad ceramic capacitor, a 2K resistor, and a zero to 10K potentiometer. This potentiometer may also be called a trim pot and its job is to let us fine-tune the resistance of the 555 circuit, which allows us to slightly adjust the frequency of the clock pulse so that we can get the exact frequency we want. Now if we look at the output of this 555, it'll look like this on the oscilloscope. Notice how it's constantly changing from high to low and low to high. Perfection. So here's our current list. The next thing we'll need is a way to start and stop the clock at the right times. Why might you ask? Well, we can't leave our clock running all the time. If we did, the shift register would constantly be overwriting data, and we want to allow the computer enough time to grab that data before something happens to it. So if we can stop the clock at the end of our byte, it'll give our computer more time to read the data from the shift register before we clear the shift register in preparation for our next byte. Another reason, and honestly, more important reason, we may want to start and stop the clock is the benefit of being able to synchronize our clock to the beginning of each start bit. Cassette players actually have slight differences in their playback speed. These differences will slightly affect the speed at which our data comes in, and over time, if we didn't synchronize, our clock pulse would drift in reference to the data. And honestly, even if our clock was perfectly tuned, which it won't be, it's very unlikely that our clock and the speed of the tape player would be in sync. So if we didn't synchronize to our start bit, eventually the clock would no longer be in sync with our data stream and we would end up getting garbage data. So doing it this way will allow us to resync the clock with the data every single time there's a new byte. So to start and stop the clock, we're going to use an awesome circuit called an SR latch. An SR latch is a type of bistable circuit. And we talked a little bit about bistable circuits earlier in the video, and there are a couple ways to make them. We're going to make ours from two NAND gates wired this way. Remember, if a circuit is in a stable state, it means it'll stay there unless acted upon. So in a bistable circuit with two stable states, it means that it'll stay in whatever state we put it in, high or low, and stay there unless something else acts on it. This is a type of memory, and we can use it to store the state of whether or not we want our clock to be running. Let's simplify this drawing a little and meet Sir Latchy. Sir Latchy has two inputs and two outputs. On the left here are his two inputs, named set and reset. You may have realized, it's not a coincidence, that this is where the SR latch gets its name. And on the right here, we have the two outputs. Their names are Q and Q bar. We'll use the Q to represent the state of Sir Latchy, whether or not he's high or low, and then Q bar will also represent his state, but Q bar will always be the opposite of whatever Q is. So if we set Sir Latchy, Q will be high, and Q bar will be low, and it'll stay this way until we reset it. When we do reset Sir Latchy, the outputs will switch. Q will be low, and then Q bar will go high. This is very useful for us. If we set the SR latch, we should be able to use the signal from the SR latch to tell the clock, hey, it's time to run. And we can tell the clock that it's time to run by using a pin on the 555 chip called reset. According to the 555 data sheet, the clock will run whenever the reset pin is connected to VCC or high and will not run whenever the reset pin is low. So if we send a high signal to the 555 reset pin from our SR latch at the beginning of our byte, it should start the clock. And then once we've received all the data for our byte, including our stop bits, we'll need to figure out a way to send Sir Latchy a reset signal, which should stop the clock. Here's where I put the SR latch on the breadboard. So now we know how to control whether or not the clock is running, but how do we know when to start and stop the clock? Well, to stop something, it first needs to be running, so let's talk about how we're going to start our clock. If you remember from our last video where we looked closely at the Kansas City standard, every new byte starts with a start bit, which is a logical low. 
And if we look at our hexadecimal 55 example, we can see that start bit right here. Remember, in between our bytes, our data line will always be high. And when data is about to arrive, our start bit goes low. So there's this transition from high to low here, and we can actually use this transition to detect when our byte is starting. But to do that, we need a circuit that detects when a signal falls from high to low. For this, we're going to use a circuit called a falling edge detector. Because, well, it detects the fall of the signal from high to low. I've built a falling edge detector out of a simple transistor and capacitor and placed it here. When our data line signal transitions from high to low, this will output a quick pulse, which I send down here into this 74HC04 chip. This chip is an inverter, or actually it's, it's multiple inverters, and there are a few signals throughout the circuit that I tie into it. It's a pretty simple chip in that it basically reverses whatever signal you send to it. So if it receives a high, it gives you low, and if it receives low, it gives you high. I'm bringing our start bit detector pulse to the input on the inverter, and then I send it over to our SR latch, which starts our clock. But then there's also this little weird thing here where I invert the signal a second time. Don't worry about it, I'll cover that briefly a bit later on, but just note this for now. So when we run our serial data through the start bit detector, the start bit pulse can be seen like in this blue line. Notice here how there is a quick pulse when the signal transitions from high to low. Also, check it out, our clock is running. Awesome! Oh, wait, wait, what's this? The start bit detector is outputting a signal every single time the signal falls, even in the middle of our byte. Well, I guess that makes sense. I mean, it's only doing what we created it for, detecting falling edges. And in this case, with our SR latch, that's probably not the worst thing as it won't change the state of the SR latch. However, we'll see a bit later that we're going to actually use this start bit signal to clear our circuit, so we need to prevent this. Our SR latch can help us inhibit these repeat signals. Remember, the SR latch is keeping track of whether or not we want the clock to run. So we should be able to use that information to help us keep the output of our start bit detector high, preventing the pulse, but only when our clock is running. So let's take the state of our SR latch and feed it through this transistor and bring the output of this transistor to the output of our detector. This keeps the signal high on the start bit detector output, which prevents the pulse. So when we do this, you'll see here that we have started our clock and we're only sending the start pulse once. Perfection! But notice, here's the next problem. The clock never stops, it just keeps going. And that brings us to our next part. Now we need a way to stop the clock, and this is actually pretty easy. For this, we're going to use the CD74HC4017 chip, and this is called a high-speed CMOS logic decade counter slash divider with 10 decoded outputs. Or to put it more simply, it counts to 10. Let's look again at our hexadecimal 55 example. When our start bit detector generates our start bit pulse, it does that right here on the falling edge. But the first pulse of our 555 clock doesn't actually happen right away in the middle of our start bit like you might expect. The first pulse actually comes right in the middle of our first bit, and this is actually due to the capacitor in our 555 circuit needing to charge first. But once it does, our clock pulses on every bit and on our two stop bits just like we'd expect. If we add these pulses up, 8-bit pulses plus 2 stop pulses, we get 10. So once we hit 10 clock pulses, we want our clock to stop. So this CD74HC4017 chip, which also just happens to count to 10, is perfect for this. Here's a bit how it works. The 4017 chip has three inputs and 10 outputs. The first input we'll talk about is the clock pin. This chip will count by one anytime the clock pin transitions from low to high. And as we continue to get more clock pulses, the chip will output the current count to the corresponding output pins, which are zero through nine. And then there's this other one marked carry or TC. The carry pin acts a little different than the others, as it's intended to be used to cascade many of these together, but the timing of it actually works quite well for us, so we're just going to consider it the 10th pin. Another input to this chip is called the clock enable, or CE, and it's used as a way to control whether or not the clock pulses affect the count. It's called an active low pin, which means it's enabled when the pin is low. If this pin is low and a clock pulse occurs, the count is added to the output. However, if this pin is high, 
when the clock pulse comes in, it's not counted and nothing happens. It doesn't change anything. So we're actually not going to use this functionality in this circuit. So we're just going to tie this one to always be low so that it's enabled. The last input to talk about is the master reset or MR pin. Anytime a high signal is sent to this input, the count is reset to zero. We're definitely going to be using this input. So here's where I placed our counter on the board and here's our 10 output. We're going to use the signal from our 10 output to reset our SR latch, which will stop our clock. You may notice though that we don't have the 10 output going directly to our SR latch. While the 10 pin acts a little different timing wise, the important thing is, is that on the 10th pulse, this pin transitions from low to high. So we want to detect this and make sure we only send a quick pulse to the SR latch. We already know how to build a falling edge detector from when we built our start bit detector, but this isn't a falling edge. This is a rising edge because it's going from low to high. So we're actually just going to bring it up here to the inverter to invert it so that it becomes a falling edge. Now we can feed that to a separate falling edge detector here and we now have a short pulse that occurs on our 10th bit. The problem with this pulse is, is that it's actually the opposite of what our SR latch needs. So we're actually just going to invert the pulse again and finally send that to our SR latch reset pin. And this stops our clock. So we should now have all the pieces and everything we need in order to decode a Kansas City standard byte. Let's walk through an entire byte cycle. So here's our data line from our demodulator in the last video. It stays high when we're in between bytes. As soon as the start bit arrives, our signal transitions to low. Our start bit detector picks up the falling edge and sends out a pulse. That pulse goes down to the inverter where the pulse is inverted. The inverted pulse is sent to the shift registers to clear any data currently stored on them. The inverted pulse is also sent to the SR latch starting our clock. But then there's this little hacky thing I do I mentioned where I invert the pulse again, essentially getting us the original but stronger signal back. This signal gets sent down to the counter reset pin, ensuring we always start our count at zero. I had some issues with the counter not resetting from the original pulse signal, but sending it through the inverter twice seemed to give the counter what it needed, so I left it at that. So back up here, the SR latch signal sets the SR latch. This activates the start bit detection inhibitor, preventing more start bits, and it also causes the reset pin of the 555 to go high, which starts our clock. The clock signal is this yellow line coming from the 555. It's fed to the counter as well as to the SIR shifty shift registers. By the time the first bit is ready on the serial line, we get our first pulse of the clock, which signals the counter to count and the shifties to latch the current bit. Then some time has passed and our next bit is ready. We get our next clock pulse, which again triggers the shift registers and the counter. This happens over and over and over again until we get to our last stop bit. On the last bit, the 10 pin goes from low to high, and we send that to our inverter to reverse it, making it a high to low, or to a falling edge, and that gets sent to our falling edge detector, which creates a nice short pulse. We send that to the inverter, which again inverts the pulse and sends that to the SR latch. The SR latch is reset by this, and this causes the reset of the 555 to go low, which stops the clock. It also disables our start bit inhibitor to ensure that we're ready to detect the next start bit, which is about to come really soon. What we now have on our shift register LEDs is the byte that came in from our demodulator, ready to be sent on to our computer. Well, hello there, lovely. So with all this in place now, we should be ready to send an entire data stream through our circuit to decode some stuff. So to decode this stuff, I'm going to connect my Arduino up to the outputs of the shift register, and then I'm going to use the SR latch to tell the Arduino when the data is ready to be read. So let's run a Kansas City standard WAV file encoded with PyKCS through the circuit and let's see what we get. Well, would you look at that? I love this stuff. That's beautiful. And there you have it, guys. We are now successfully decoding data from our Kansas City Standard audio stream. Sweet. 
In our next video, we're gonna be tying this into our 6502 computer. We're gonna be writing some code in order to handle the data coming in. And maybe, just maybe, we'll be able to actually run a program from cassette. It's gonna be awesome. Thank you so much for being here, guys. If you enjoyed this, please consider subscribing or checking out my Patreon I recently set up. I've got some fun things coming up, not involving Kansas City Standard Audio, but we're still going to be modifying the 6502. It's going to be awesome. I can't wait to create them. I'd love it if you were there. Thank you so much. We'll see you guys in the next video, and I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Bye for now.